and welcome to the online service at Schenkel Baptist Church. This morning, my name is Billy Duff, and I am a member of the church here at Schenkel. No matter who you are or where you are joining us from, we are very happy to welcome you and hope you are blessed by this morning's service. Later in our service, we will be taking communion, and we would encourage you, if you are walking with the Lord, to join us by please getting some bread and some juice prepared. If after the service you feel blessed with what you have heard and what we would encourage you to share the service on your social media, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, etc., so that we can spread the message of salvation, that as many as people as possible can get the opportunity to hear from God's Word. We will be meeting again on Wednesday night. We will delve into God's Word in a midweek in Bible study and afterwards for a time of prayer. If you have any matters that needs you to, would like to pray for, please contact us on the number below. And we would encourage you all to pray for the continuing success of the ongoing work here at Shankill. Finally, before we join the service here this morning, please take time, your convenience, to check our other services here on YouTube. And please subscribe so that you are notified of any new content. Now let's step inside for the service. Good morning. And welcome to our morning worship, coming to you from Shankill Baptist Church in Tennant Street. We do welcome you in the Lord's name. We thank you for joining us today. And we trust and pray that this service might be a source of blessing, comfort, and help to you just where you are. So wherever you are, and wherever you're listening from, welcome. We welcome you in our Saviour's name. Just one or two necessary announcements. Our service concludes with the remembrance of the Lord and the breaking of bread. And if you know and love the Saviour and are walking in fellowship with Him, He invites you and instructs you to remember Him in this His appointed way. This afternoon at half past three, our Sunday school and Bible class, we meet for prayer at half past six prior to our evening service at 7 o'clock. And then on Wednesday evening, it is our church night at half past 7. A very special night this week as we look forward to the visit of John and Lourdes Brew, who have served the Lord for many, many years in the land of Peru with our Baptist mission. John worshipped in this church as a young man and so we look forward uh, to his visit along with his wife, Lourdes. This will be his last deputation in the mission as he's retiring very soon. And so it's an opportunity for us to come and express our appreciation of his life and ministry and service for God in Peru. Why not make that special effort? Maybe you're not in the habit of coming regularly. You know John and Lourdes and you'd like to join us. You'll be more than welcome on Wednesday evening at half past seven. Thursday evening, it's Women's Night. Our Women's Fellowship meet at half past seven on Thursday evening. Ladies, it's an evening for you. And our special guest on Thursday evening is Audrey and Victor Maxwell, who have served the Lord in the Amazon for many, many years. And they will belong to share their story. What a wonderful story it is. I will have the opportunity of interviewing them and chatting with them. Why not come along? It'll be a very relaxing evening. Uh, come along, ladies. Bring your friends with you and enjoy an evening in the company of Audrey and Victor Maxwell. That's Thursday evening at half past seven. The service is next Lord Day, the last Sunday in January. And our guest speaker, both in the morning and the evening, is Andrew Daly. All these meetings are announced subject to the sovereign will of God. Let's worship God. And let's hear his word as we read Psalm 8. This is the word of the Lord. O Lord, our Lord. 
How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes, to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honour. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we thank God for his word. Let's worship God this morning as we join our hearts and voices in praising him, singing these great words, crown him with many crowns.
Let's pray together. Almighty and sovereign God, we thank you again for the privilege and opportunity to join our hearts and voices at this time to worship you. We come with all your people in heaven and on earth to lift our hearts and voices and give to you the praise, the honor that is due to your great and glorious name. You are our God. You are our King. We know that our words can never fully express your greatness. Our minds can only begin to recognize something of your wonder. But we recall that in your revealed word you have taught us that those who would draw near to God must believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him. We come by faith. And in these moments we pray for the help that we need to make our worship pleasing and acceptable to you who are in heaven. You are the almighty God. Yours is the hand that shaped the universe. Yours is the power that guides and controls the nations. Yours is the love that moves and works through all things. And yours is the purpose that has called us to yourself. Touch our hearts this morning by the nearness of your presence. Deepen our faith, strengthen our commitment, broaden our vision so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. You have redeemed us by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, your Son. Through him you have opened up the way to life and peace and joy. And as we sing these inspiring hymns and spiritual songs, as we read your word, meditate upon it, and break bread in accordance with your holy will, draw near. Father in heaven, we worship you as we offer our praise and bring to you our thanksgiving. And we pray that the words of our mouths and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. And as a result of our coming together in this place to praise and worship you, the only wise and true and living God, may your name be honoured and glorified among your people. Inspire us with new vision and fresh hope and send us away with new purpose. Bless all who will listen to our service uh, by means of technology, maybe in their home, maybe in a room by themselves. Lord, Bless this worship service to them. Hear our prayer. Receive our praise as we bring them to you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to continue to worship God as we sing of the one who is our shepherd. That lovely Psalm, Psalm 23 and sing it to a modern setting. The Lord's my shepherd, and I will trust in thee alone. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. Leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul, and I will trust in you alone. And I will trust in you. mercy follows me your goodness will lead me home he guides my ways in righteousness and he anoints my head with oil and my
continue to look to God in prayer as we pray for the needs of our nation, our province, our world, as we pray for you, as we pray for one another, as we come to a great and awesome God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue in your presence this morning, we bless you that we can draw near to your throne. We reflect upon all that you have done for us in Christ. And we pray that you'll help us to respond to such love and mercy and grace with thankful and obedient hearts. May our wills be surrendered to your will. Forgive us for those times when as your children we sin and grieve you, when our thoughts, our words, our actions are so hurtful and displeasing to our Heavenly Father. When we draw near with our lips, but at the same time our hearts are far from you. We pray for one another, for you have instructed us to do that, and we bear one another's burden before your throne. You are the friend of sinners, and we thank you for the forgiveness that you have brought to us through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray for the Church of Jesus Christ this morning in different parts of the world. We pray that you will make your presence real to them. We think today of many who are suffering for their faith, persecuted for their loyalty to Jesus Christ, for their unswerving devotion to their Heavenly Master. Some are isolated from family and friends this morning in prison under very, very difficult circumstances. Lord, we will remember them in our prayers. We pray for all who are in need today, for many parts of the world where there is great hardship and poverty. We pray that you will forgive us if we are guilty of taking the many privileges that we enjoy for granted, especially the freedom to meet as we are meeting here just now. For all who are in need today, we pray the sick and suffering, the poor and the hungry, the oppressed, the exploited, the lonely, the desolate, the aged, the infirm, the frightened, the anxious, the sorrowful, the bereaved, the helpless and the hopeless. O oh God, reach out to them this morning through your church and may we never be insensitive to their needs. We pray for those of our church family who are confined to nursing care and this the even tide of their life. Father, lovingly we commend them to you. For some who are recovering from recent surgery, God bless them. Others who are battling with ongoing health issues, Lord, give them the grace and the strength that they need. Gracious God, reach out to all for whom the future seems so uncertain, unwelcoming, and bring to such that assurance that even in the darkest moments of when facing the greatest challenges and encountering the most worrying of circumstances, that you are there. You have always been there and you will always be there. We thank you this morning that you're able to shine in the darkness, that you can bring 
hope where there is despair, joy where there is sorrow and good out of evil. We ask that you will give to us the confidence that we need to know. The confidence that is rooted in the knowledge that there was nothing in heaven and earth, in life or death, in the present or the future, that is able to separate us from your love. Hear our prayer. We bring it to you along with our prayers. We worship you this morning. We adore you this morning. We recognize that you are Jehovah God and beside you there is no one else. And we offer this prayer and praise in the mighty and matchless name of your beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And for your glory. Amen. Amen. Here's a lovely prayer based on the words of the psalmist. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after thee. Let's sing it before we come to the word of God. Thank you. Again to the second book of Kings, chapter 2. Second Kings, chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 1. Second Kings, chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And this is the word of the Lord. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. 
And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. And Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophet also went and stood at some distance from them. As they both were standing by the Jordan, then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And Elisha went over. This is the word of the Lord. And we give thanks to God for his word. We're coming again this morning to this unique passage of scripture in the second book of Kings and the second chapter. It records for us the closing incident in the life of Elijah and brings our attention to one of the most touching incidents in his whole history. We're going to learn this morning that this great prophet of God had a departure from earth every bit as marvelous and wonderful as his life and ministry. We learn from the word of God that he was taken to heaven without dying. He was translated to the realms of glory without having to go the way of all the earth. And of course, as we mentioned last Sunday morning, the only person that had a similar experience was Enoch, of whom we read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5, that by faith Enoch was translated so that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. This morning we focus our attention again on God's servant, Elijah. You remember last Sunday morning we looked at the various places that are identified here in Second Kings 2. The places that... Elijah visited Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and Jordan. Significant places in the geography of the Bible and in the history of the children of Israel. Places where God revealed himself to his servants. Gilgal, we learned that the God of Elijah was the essential God without him. He could do nothing. At Bethel, he learned that he was the faithful God, faithful even unto death. 
at Jericho, we learn he was the powerful God that even the walls of Jericho could not stand against him. And of course, at the Jordan, he was the miraculous God, the God of the impossible, the God to whom nothing is too hard. What a God! And these places, these sanctified, significant places in Holy Scripture brings our attention to such a God. But there are two other things I want you to note this morning as we look at this passage again. Having looked at the places he visited, let's think this morning about the parting that he experienced. The parting that he experienced. The grand moment had at last arrived. The climax of Elijah's life and ministry had dawned. His conflict was over, his course run, and his victory won. The moment had been reached when, like Abraham of old, he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. His eyes were firmly fixed on that bright and better land which God had prepared for those who love him. And you will notice as you consider this parting that the parting was supernatural. We read in uh, verse 11 of uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 2 uh, these words. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind in uh, to heaven. Some translations put it like this. It came to pass. Then it happened. And he went up into heaven. He didn't go by the chariot. But he went by the whirlwind into heaven. What a supernatural passing. The New Testament tells us that if Christ should come for us. Instead of calling us in death. That our parting from this earth will just be as supernatural as Elijah's was. That we will be caught up, says the Apostle, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. The word caught up means to be snatched away. It refers to that act of God which will convey the living saints from earth to the sky. And we're winning for that day and as God's children we're ready for that day this party was supernatural and so will be the party of God's children from this earth the party was sudden Elijah was walking and talking with Elisha when suddenly both men were parted by the whirlwind which took Elijah up to heaven the one outstanding feature of the prophet of God was that he was ready to go regardless of the suddenness of the call. And the whole tenor of the New Testament is to the effect that the Lord's coming for his own will be marked by suddenness. Jesus says this in Matthew 24 and verse 44, Therefore also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. There was a great preacher by the name of Horatius Bonner. And when he was retiring for the evening, he would have drawn the curtains over in his drawing room. And he would say, perhaps tonight, Lord. The next day when he opened them for a new day, he would have said, perhaps Today, Lord, he lived in the expectancy of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The hymn was like this, I am waiting for the coming of the Lord who died for me. Oh, his words have thrilled my spirit. I will come again for thee. I can almost hear his footfall on the threshold of the door. 
And my heart, my heart is longing to be his forevermore. The parting was supernatural. The parting was sudden. And the parting was sacred. The one great thing that strikes us about this experience of Elijah the prophet is that he went straight to heaven without having any experience of death. And I believe in what the Bible teaches that there will be an innumerable multitude of people who will go to heaven one day without passing through the gates of death. Why am I so sure about that sacred fact? Because of what the Bible says. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. And he says this, Behold, I show you or I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall not all die. But we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. The same writer writes in 1 Thessalonians 4. And he says this in verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. With a cry of command. With the voice of an archangel. And with the, the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive who are left, uh, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, therefore, in the light of this, in view of this, comfort one another, encourage one another, strengthen one another with these words. This Old Testament incident reminds me of this great truth. That Jesus is coming again. We have recently celebrated the first advent. But we are anticipating the second advent. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is surely coming again. The Bible declares it. There are 70 references in the word of God to repentance. There are 20 references to baptism, six, ref six references to the Lord's Supper. There are 318 references to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is drawing near. Jesus is coming again because the Bible declares it. Jesus is coming again because history demands it. History is full of confusion, says some people. Others say it's heading for chaos. It's going around in circles. But we believe that the Bible would teach us that history is heading for a climax. Because history is his story. And one of these days, Jesus will fulfill his promise and he will come for his own. The Bible declares that history demands it. The Christian's experience confirms it. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 20. He says, but now Christ has become the first fruits of them that sleep. The first fruits was a, a farming terminology. And these people to whom Paul addresses this letter will have understood what he meant. He was taking them back to a harvest scene in the Old Testament when the first fruits of the harvest were given to the high priest who went into the sanctuary and waved them before Jehovah, the God of heaven and earth. And that was the guarantee that the rest of the harvest was going to follow. Jesus is the first fruits. And because he has been raised from the dead in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those saints who have died in Christ will be raised from the grave. And together with living saints will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And we shall ever be with the Lord. Paul writes in Romans chapter 13. He says the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For your salvation is near to you. 
than when you first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The day of your salvation is nearer than when you first believed. What did he mean by that? Well, the word salvation in the Bible is taught in three ways. The Bible teaches us that we are saved, we are being saved, and one day we shall be saved. Through the work of Christ on the cross, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. Through the gracious ministry of the Holy Spirit within us, we are being saved from the power of sin. And when Jesus returns again, we shall be saved from the very presence of sin. The hymn writer says, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Should the Lord Jesus Christ come this very hour, this very day, here's the question that you need to ask this morning as you listen into our service. Am I ready? Am I ready to meet Jesus when he comes again? If not, then now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And call upon him while he is near. The places he visited. The parting he experienced. And noticed the purpose he acknowledged. When the prophet set off from Gilgal with his servant Elisha. He knew that he was on his very last journey here. He knew that the time for him to depart was drawing near. And he also knew the reason behind God's call. He could read all the signs very clearly indeed. Because as we have often, so often said, here was a man who lived in close communion with God. Perhaps God had led him into the sacred place, so to speak, before his translation from earth to glory. Elijah was prepared to fit in with God's will for his life. For he knew, as he should know, that God's will was always the best for him. Don't we still believe that? That God's way is the best way? That God's time is the right time? Uh, that God's grace is sufficient grace? We sometimes sing, God plans the very best for me. Do we still believe that in all things God is working for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose? Notice here the purpose of God that Elijah acknowledges. Elijah was going to finish the task. He was going to finish the task. For many years Elijah had been God's representative in a heathen and an apostate land. His task was far from easy as he sought to bring a nation to its knees before God. Many were his heartaches and worries. He lost blood, sweat and tears as he sought to do God's will. In fact, on one occasion at least, he found himself at the end of his tether, pleading with God to take his life away from him. On that memorable day when the whirlwind assured him, or ushered him, into heaven it signaled the fact that his work on earth was finished and completed and as he went up the prophet could have said with the great apostle I am now ready I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand I have fought a good fight I have finished my course I have kept the faith finally there is led up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will Give to me in that day, and not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. There's a day coming when we will have to finish our task on earth. Will we be able to look with confidence, knowing that we've done our very best for the Lord? Notice that the purpose of God was twofold here. The purpose of God that is acknowledged here. It was a purpose that reminds us that Elijah would finish the task. And secondly, that Elisha 
would further the task. Alicia would further the task. You know, the great Methodist preacher John Wesley once said that God buries his workmen or God removes his workmen but carries on his work. And that's very true, isn't it? We see that in the experience of Moses and Joshua. Here's how the book of Joshua opens. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land I am giving to them, and to the people of Israel. God had removed his servant Moses, but in place of Moses there came a Joshua. What was true in that incident is also true with regard to Elijah and Elisha. Immediately Elijah laid down his mantle, Elisha took it up and carried on with the task that was committed to him. You see, although Elijah was a mighty man and a missed man, he was not indispensable. I want you to listen carefully to what I'm saying this morning. Don't misunderstand this. He could be done without and indeed was done without. And isn't this a truth that we all need to remember? None of us are indispensable. We're all needed. And we should all be found faithful. I often think that the overworked saint is a witness to those who do not want to know anything about responsibility. They want the work to go on, to prosper, to be blessed of God. But they themselves want to play very little part, a minimum involvement that leaves their options open, that leaves them free to do their own thing. Someone has said it's a bit like a football match. Twenty people on the field of play in need of a rest, being jeered at by thousands who are in need of exercise. Never look upon yourself as being indispensable. The work will go on without you and without me. But look upon yourself as a sinner saved by grace who is privileged, privileged to have some part to play in the service of God. What happens when you and I are called home to glory? Well, someone will take our place and hopefully do an even better job. It's dangerous to think that we cannot be done without. It's blessed to appreciate all that the Lord has done for us and in response to such love and mercy, goodness and grace to serve him all the days of our lives. What does the song say? I will serve him because I love him. He has given his life for me. You know, we are treading today where the saints of old have trod. Men like Elijah and Elisha. And the challenge this morning to me and the challenge to you is this. Am I as faithful in this generation as our forefathers were in this generation? If you were sitting in this church this morning, to my right, there is a text of scripture. Behold, I come. It's been there a lifetime. It's been there all the days that I've ever attended this church. And to my left, there's another text. And both are related. This text says, Behold, I come quickly. The suddenness of the Lord's coming. In an hour when you think not, the Lord himself will come. This could be the last Sunday that we will ever broadcast. This could be the last Lord's day we will ever meet in this house. He's coming in that unexpected moment. In an hour when you think not, be ready. And if you're a child of God, what does the Lord want you to do? He wants you to occupy till 
he comes to be involved how? in the ministry of prayer in the privilege of giving to the Lord's work in the privilege of sharing the good news of the gospel with those with whom you come in contact with you in your small corner and I in mine oh the lessons to be learned from these words that we have read this morning the places that Elijah visited Gilgal an essential God Bethel a faithful God Jericho a powerful God Jordan a miraculous God the parting he experienced it was supernatural it was sudden it was sacred the purpose he acknowledged he finished the task he furthered the task and he was faithful in the task. A traveller came upon a beautiful villa situated on the shores of a great lake in Switzerland. Far from the beaten track of the tourists. The traveller knocked on the gate and an aged warden appeared and undid the lock and invited him to enter in. The warden seemed glad to see him and proceeded to show him round the magnificent gardens which were very well kept. How long have you been here? asked the tourist. Twenty-four years, replied the warden. How often has your master visited the gardens? Once, was the reply. Once? Yeah. And yet you have these gardens looking the way they're looking, as if he was coming tomorrow. And the warden looked at him and he said, Tomorrow? He could come today. He could come today. Behold, I come quickly. Occupy till I come. We thank God for his word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word of the Lord that lives and abides forever. We thank you for this glorious truth that we have seen through this incident in the life of Elijah and Elisha. Reminding us again that you are the God who has made every promise to be yea and amen in your son Jesus Christ. The God who has spoken to us in creation and the God who has spoken to us in his Son, Jesus Christ. And the God who speaks to us through his word. That word that tells us not to let our hearts be troubled. But to believe in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ. That word that tells us that Jesus Christ has said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. So Father, help us, O oh God, to realize that there is coming a day, even today, when that promise will be fulfilled. May we seek to live in the light of this unshakable truth. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Christ's sake. Amen. Abraham Lincoln, former president of the United States of America, was a man who campaigned against slavery. Abraham Lincoln's determination to abolish this injustice ultimately motivated an opponent by the name of John Wilkes Booth to assassinate him. And that assassination took place in Ford's Theatre, Washington, on a good Friday in 1865. When Lincoln's body was brought through the streets of Washington, a black woman in the crowd raised her little boy high to see the cortege. And as she did that, she said, Take a good look at him, son. He died for you. Take a good look at him, son. He died for you. 1,800 years before Lincoln, 
A man died on Good Friday. And his death was more significant than the death of Abraham Lincoln. His name, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. The God-Man. He died on the cross and then rose again to set us free from the greatest slavery of all, the slavery of sin. And for all who accept his gift of salvation, there comes forgiveness with the assurance of life after death in heaven. And as we come to remember the Lord Jesus Christ in the breaking of bread, we take a good look at him. We sometimes sing those words, Give me a sight, O Saviour, of thy wondrous love to me, of the love that brought thee down to earth to die on Calvary. O make me understand it. Help me to take it in, what it meant for thee, the Holy One, to bear away my sin. The story of the Bible is the story of the Lamb. It begins in Genesis and it continues throughout eternity. In Genesis 22, he's the promised Lamb. Isaac speaks to his father Abraham and he says, Abraham, my father. And Abraham responds and says, Here am I, my son. And the boy speaks again, he says, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And then Abraham speaks this prophetic word, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. God provided the lamb that day. And God provided the lamb that you and I need. In Genesis 22, he's the promised lamb. In Exodus 12, He's the Passover lamb. Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, Christ is our Passover lamb. The sinless lamb. The lamb without blemish, without spot. The perfect lamb, perfect within and perfect without. The slain lamb. The sufficient lamb. A promised lamb. A Passover lamb. In Isaiah 53 we come to a prophesied lamb. He's led as a lamb to the slaughter, submissive, surrendered, suffering. In John 1, 28, he's the personified lamb. John is on the banks of the Jordan. And he makes this great statement, Behold, the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. And this promised lamb, this Passover lamb, this prophesied lamb, this personified lamb in Jesus Christ is the glorified lamb in heaven worshipped by the angelic throng and the multitudes have gone before. And here's their song. Revelation 5 and 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and blessing. He alone is worthy. Samuel Rutherford in his great hymn The Sands of Time Are Sinking has these very meaningful words. The Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's Lamb. We come this morning to this table. We are about to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And as we do so we took a look, take a look again at the Lamb. The promised lamb, the Passover lamb, the prophesied lamb, the personified lamb, and in heaven this morning, the glorified lamb. Let's worship him this morning. And let's sing the words of that lovely hymn written by Robert Murray McShane. When this passing world is done. And after we've sung this hymn, we shall break the bread and we shall drink of the cup.
continue to worship God this morning and express our love for him in obedience to his word. And as we gather around this table, and in a moment or two eat of this bread and drink of this cup, let's again focus our gaze on the Christ of God, the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of remembering the Lord Jesus in this, your divinely appointed way. And as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we give you thanks for what it reminds us of, the one who bore our sins in his body upon the tree, and the one who shed his precious blood that we might live. So as we eat and as we drink, in doing so, we confess our utter dependence upon all that Christ has accomplished for us in his once and for all sacrifice at the place called Calvary. Amen. The same night in which the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take eat. This is my body which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup, saying here was the new covenant in his blood. And we know that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Father, we come to the close of our service and we thank you for help given and for any measure of blessing experience we give you the honour and the praise and the glory. We thank you for the privilege that has been ours to sing your praise, to read your word and to learn from the things that you revealed in the sacred scriptures. And now to have remembered the Lord Jesus Christ in the breaking of bread. We thank you for moments like these. We pray that as we go out into a new week, that your grace, your mercy and your peace might be upon us. And upon all whom we love this day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening. Could I remind you again of... Our evening service at 7 o'clock of our special church night on Wednesday evening at half seven and the ladies night at half past seven on Thursday evening. Why not come along? You will be more than welcome to these gatherings. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and grant to you his peace, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.